uh, as a means of foreign investment. But when you look at foreign investment, it's not just FDI, it's much more than FDI. And um, at least over the last couple of years, what I'm seeing is an increasing shift towards the other schedules for coming into India rather than coming via FDI. And at the end of my presentation, I'll ask you a question. Who needs Schedule 1 and its problems when you can have 2A to 11? And which is a red carpet, why would you go through the problems of Schedule 1? And at the end, I'm sure many of us would agree that you know coming in otherwise than through an FDI route is much easier and convenient as compared to Schedule 1. So let's first look at uh, the foreign investment buckets which are available to an investor who wants to come into India. First, FDI Schedule 1. And all of this is governed by the FEMA regulations TISPRO, that is transfer of ratio of security to a person resident outside India. This notification, in fact, is about to change into something newer and current, but it's yet not been done unlike the other regulations. This Schedule 1, as Naresh I would have dealt with, is also governed by the consolidated FBI policy issued by the Ministry of Commerce. So the FEMA TISPRO plus the CFDIP both look at Schedule 1. We then come to share transfer that is covered under regulation 10 of the FEMA regulations that is transfer from a non-resident to a resident and vice versa. Lastly, you have other foreign types of investment that is schedules 2A to 11 of the FEMA disc flow and regulation 7 and 8. Now this is what I intend to cover in the next one and a half hour. Let's look at the various buckets which are available. So you have ESOPs and mergers, you have registered foreign portfolio investors, and besides that, I've written the scheduled number, which are known by Schedule 2A and Schedule 5. You have non-resident Indians investing on a portfolio investment basis, that is Schedule 3 and 5. You have non-resident Indians investing on a non-repatriated basis, that is Schedule 4. You have a foreign venture capital investor under Schedule 6. Indian depository receipt under Schedule 7 and 10. Investment in a sole proprietor or a firm and a limited liability partnership in Schedule 9 and lastly an investment vehicle under Schedule 11. So these are the various other foreign investments which you can look at other than an FDI, other than transfer of shares to a non -risk. Let's first look at mergers and ESOPs. For employee stock option plans, Regulation 8 of the FEMA TISPRO regulations provide that Indian companies can issue equity shares by way of ESOP or sweat equity to non-resident employees, directors who are non-resident of either the company or its holding company or a joint venture or a subsidiary. So you have four types of companies which can be covered, the company, its hold co, its subsidiary and its joint venture. But the employees should be non-residents because you are looking at foreign investment in the country. The scheme must be as per SEBI regulations or the Companies Act 2013 as the case. Now this is an important change compared to 2015. Prior to 2015, the regulations provided that all schemes must be in sync with the SEBI regulation, whether you are listed, unlisted, private or public. Now it says if you are listed, follow the SEBI regulations. If you are unlisted, follow the company's rules of shares and ventures issued under the Companies Act 2013. Although now the unlisted rules are also pari materia with the SEBI regulations, but there are some differences. Hence, select whichever is applicable. ESOPs must be within the sectoral caps applicable to a company. So if it's a company where 100% foreign investment is available, no sectoral cap, you can have any amount of ESOP. But if it is a company where there is a sectoral cap, so like 49% or 74%, then your total foreign investment including the ESOP must be within that sectoral cap. Prior to 2015, the limit was 5% flat, whether you were in a sectoral cap company or you were not. So that's another major change in the ESOP regulations as compared to prior to 2015. If FDI is possible only on a government route, then the ESOP requires FIPB approval. So if you are operating within a sector where you need FIPB approval for prior FDI, you need FIPB approval even for the ESOP. Take an example of a private security agency. So you have Tox Group or you have Tiger Security. If they want to issue ESOPs to their employee who are non resident, they would need FIPB approval. And ESOP to a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi citizen would require prior approval from the FIB. So this is the regulation dealing with ESOPs. This is one of the ways in which you could have foreign investment other than FDI. Next we look at mergers which are covered by regulation 7 of the main regulations. 
Indian companies merging or demerging or undergoing a scheme of restructure. So you have an Indian company which is foreign shareholding which is merging into another Indian company and as a consequence of the merger, the transferee company is issuing shares to the foreign shareholders of the transferor company. That is on an automatic route provided the following conditions are satisfied. The percentage of non-resident shareholding in the transferee after the merger is within the sectoral caps or as per the FIBB approval, whichever is applicable. The transferor or the transferee are not in the following restricted areas. So agricultural, plantation, print area, real estate business, trading and transferable development rights. If any of them or if both of them are operating within this sector, they need prior RBI approval or FIBB approval as the case may be for issuing shares on merger. So print media, so if you have Jagran Prakashan, which is merging with another company or another company HT Media merging into Jagran Prakashan and then issuing shares to the foreign shareholders, you need prior government or RBI approval and Regulation 7 would not apply on an automatic basis. The scheme must be approved by the High Court in India under Section 391 to 394 of the Companies Act to 1956, which will now be superseded by the National Company Law Tribunal under the Companies Act 2013. So as and when NCLT takes charge, it would require the approval of NCLT and not High Court. And the transferee company must file full details of the issue within 30 days of the issue. So it needs to file with RBI a record of the number of shares, who are the details, etc. within 30 days of the issue of shares. What about foreign mergers? Now this only talks about two Indian companies merging and issuing shares to foreign shareholders. What if a foreign company merges into an Indian company? And the Indian company issues shares to the foreign shareholders of the foreign company. A, is that possible under the Companies Act and B, is it possible under FAMA? Under the Companies Act, both the 1956 Act as well as the 2013 Act, a foreign company can merge into an Indian company. What is required <coughs> is that the transferee, that must be a company within the Act, but the transferor can be a body corporate. And the definition of body corporate under Section 2 of the Companies Act includes a company incorporated abroad. So you can have a foreign company which is going out of existence <coughs> and merging into an Indian company which continues as a surviving company. You have various high court decisions like Bombay Gas Company, Adani Enterprises, uh, most of semiconductors which have approved such a merger of a foreign company with an Indian company. What if shares are to be issued to the non-resident shareholders of the transferor company? Now this is something on which FEMA is silent and this being a capital account transaction, it would require prior RBI approval since it is an issue for consideration other than cash, it will also require FIPB approval because this is not something which is covered under the FDI policy or under the schedule dealing with uh, consideration other than cash. Hence, you would require FIPB approval for such a merger.